Good morning to you. Today we are taking up Constitution. We have completed the, up to Article 35, that is fundamental rights. Now we are taking up directive principles of state policy. This is part four, covering articles from 36 to 51. Kindly take down simultaneously, scribble down the important points. This was finalized by SAPRU committee, inspired by Irish constitution, which in turn was inspired by Spanish constitution. So three things, SAPRU committee, Irish constitution, then Spanish constitution. The basic aim of these principles is to set up in India a social welfare state as distinguished from a mere police state. These directive principles are unique blend of socialistic, Gandhian and Western liberal principles. These principles aim to create an egalitarian society. Article 36 gives, gives the same definition for the term state as we have seen in Article 12. I remember I have already told you for both Part 3 and Part 4, same definition given in Article 12 applies. Then Article 37 makes it clear that the directive principles are not enforceable through court of law. Nevertheless, it has been categorically stated that these directive principles are fundamental in the governance of the country and it is the duty of the state to apply these principles in making laws. Remember, the term duty has been used only in Article 37. Fundamental and it is the duty of the state. The term duty has been used only in Article 37. Remember, nowhere else. And simultaneously, remember, Article 38 and 39, both these articles are called distributive justice. Article 38, 39, distributive justice. So, if there is a question, what are the articles which speak about distributive justice? The answer is Article 38 and 39. Then, remember, these directive principles are divided into three categories. Number one, socialistic principle. Number two, Gandhian principles. And number three, liberal Western principles. So, three types of principles. Socialistic, Gandhian, liberal Western principles. Now, we should know important socialistic as well as Gandhian and as well as liberal principles. What are the socialistic principles? First is Article 38. For securing a social order, for promotion of welfare of the people by securing and protecting their socio-economic and political justice in the national life. Secondly, Article 39. This contains the principle of policy to be followed by the state, in particular, the right to adequate means of livelihood for all citizens, both men and women, equally. Ownership and control of material resources of the community should be so distributed in such a way as to subserve the common good, good, hood. Secondly, remember, the operation of economic system 
does not result in concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment of the society then comes equal pay for equal work for both men and women then health and strength of the workers men women and children are not abused nor forced to by economic necessity to enter into any job unsuited to their age and strength and also children are given all facilities to develop in a healthy manner in continuous in, in achieving the freedom and dignity with their protection against exploitation and moral and material abandonment then comes article 39a it provides equal justice and free legal aid then article 41 which assures right to work right to education right to public assistance in case of unemployment old age assistance sickness assistance disablement public assistance for disablement etc and article 43 mandates that the state should secure to all workers and industries otherwise a living wage conditions of work with a decent standard of living enjoyment of leisure in particular promotion of cottage industry on industrial areas on cooperative basis in rural areas then article 43a this speaks about participation of workers in management of industries article 45 promotes for early childhood care and education to children below the age of 6 remember i have told you three additional thing one is right to education second is article 45 and third is as you know we have added in the fundamental duty k this is narrative principle then comes we are coming to gandhian principles which include article 40 regarding organization of village panchayats article 46 promotion of educationally and economic interests of the scheduled caste scheduled tribe and other weaker section of society remember then comes article 47 imposing a duty to raise the level of nutrition and standard of living to improve public health and to bring about prohibition of intoxicating drinks and drugs then article 48 speaks about organization of agricultural animal husbandry and also to prohibit cow slaughter then comes liberal principles which are very important which include article 39a which speaks about equal justice and free legal aid article 44 directs the state to bring about uniform civil code article 44 remember examination point of view very important article 50 speaks about separation of judiciary from executive in public services of the state and article 51 emphasize promotion of international peace and security these are all the three kinds of directive principles now you see the directive principles impose positive obligation on the state they can be implemented by executive action so long as they do not contravene any law they are in the form of general instructions even though they are not justiciable that it cannot be enforced through court of law they have been declared as i told you as fundamental to the governance of the country and in a duty has been imposed on the state to implement them while making law secondly following amendment from the examination point of view remember following amendments have been made in the directive principles remember 42nd amendment made then 44th amendment made. these two are very important 
42nd Amendment Act 1976 added four directive principles. Number one is Article 39 to secure opportunities for healthy development of children. Then Article 39A, equal justice and free legal aid for the poor. Then Article 43A, participation of workers in the management of industries. Then Article 48A, regarding protection of environment and to safeguard forest and wildlife. So, this is 42nd Amendment Act 1976, which added four directive principles. Then 44th Amendment Act 1978, Janata period, added one class under Article 38 uh, on minimizing the equality in income and also to eliminate the inequality in status, facility and opportunity, not only among the individuals, but also among the various groups of people. Remember, this is 44th Amendment Act 1978. Previously, I told you 42nd Amendment Act 1976. Now, thirdly, 86th Amendment Act 2002 amended the subject matter of Article 45. The article now provides for early childhood care and education for all children up to the age of 6. Remember, 42nd Amendment Act 1976 added four directive principles and 44th Amendment Act added one directive principle and the 86th Amendment Act amended one article, that is Article 45. Fourthly, 97th Amendment Act 2011, very important, added Article 43B regarding promotion of voluntary formation and autonomous functioning, democratic control and professional management of cooperative societies. So, remember, four separate items, 42nd, 44th and 86th and 97th Amendment but what has been added from the examination point of view, addition to the directive principles are very important. Secondly, let us say what are the what are the differences between directive principle and fundamental right? Very important. Again, fundamental rights are limitation upon the state action. Directive principles are in the nature of instrument of instruction to government to do certain things and for achieving certain objectives. So, one is a limitation and the other is a direction. Secondly, fundamental rights can be enforced through court of law by invoking Article 32 and Article 226, whereas directive principles are not enforceable through court of law. Second difference. Third is, the directives require to be implemented by legislation. Therefore, if there is a law to carry out the policy of the directive, then you can implement. Otherwise, the fundamental right will provide over the directive principle. Fourthly, fundamental rights lay down negative obli obligation of the state and prohibitive in nature, whereas directive principles are affirmative direction dealing with the positive obligation. Remember, positive obligation. Then, the purpose of fundamental right is to establish political democracy by guarding the equality, liberty, religious freedom and cultural and educational right, which we have already seen in the fundamental rights. But the purpose of directive principle is to establish socio-economic and political order. Remember, one is welfare state, in fact. What is the relations between the principle of directive principles and fundamental right? How do you relate? How do you reconcile? How do you how do you harmonize the between the two? That is the question. So remember, I remember to told you in the earlier, I think the second or third time I am repeating, but it is very important, it should go into your mind. The first important case with reference to the directive principle and fundamental right is. Chenbagam Rajan versus Union of India versus, sorry, versus State of Madras in 1951. 
in the in this case remember schedule uh, the supreme court ruled that the reservation of seat in education institution and public employment provided by madras state is unconstitutional because it violated article 14 supreme court said that the directive principles are always subordinate to the fundamental rights this is the decision of supreme court in chenbagan vararajan versus state of madras in 1951 accordingly the first amendment act 1951 added article 31a article 31b schedule 9 and also amended article 15 providing reservation for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe this is on the this is the first reservation made then fourth amendment act 1955 nationalized the trade that is transports then 17th amendment 1956 introduced classification of states remember three amendments the first amendment fourth amendment and 17th amendment have been made from 1951 to 1956 now all these amendments were challenged in the golaknath versus state of punjab case in 1957 very important case kindly follow closely they it was challenged that is first amendment fourth amendment 17th amendment these three amendments were challenged before supreme court in golaknath versus state of punjab 1957 case supreme court declared number 1 parliament cannot alter fundamental rights number 2 the term law mentioned in article 13 includes constitutional law also number 3 article 13 puts an embargo on the amending powers of the parliament what the, what is the embargo the state shall not make any law which taking away or abridging any other rights conferred in part 3 of the constitution so it puts an embargo on the parliament in touching any provision of the constitution number 4 article 368 which speaks about the amendment amendment provides only the procedure not the powers kindly see the old constitution article 368 says only procedure to amend the constitution so supreme court said the article 368 is giving only the procedure where are the powers then fifthly their argument that the supreme court argument is parliament is elected only to rule for not for amending the constitution for amending the constitution you should constitute constant assembly this is the fifth argument sixth argument parliament is only the creature of the constitution which is the creator how can the creature meddle with the creator so these are all the seven or six arguments put forth by supreme court in the golaknath case and declared that the amendment for fourth amendment and uh, the, sorry the uh, parliament has no powers to amend any part of the constitution nevertheless by the time how many amendments up to 17 amendments have already been passed and put in force so what will happen to this amendment so they propounded what is popularly known as doctrine of prospective overruling and said the overruling is only prospective this i think i have already explained to you then mrs indira gandhi brought about 24th amendment act 1971 with the following changes what are the changes major changes number 1 amended the caption of article 368 instead of procedure to amend the constitution she, she added power and procedure to amend the constitution number 1 number 2 article 13 amended protecting the constitutional amendment from the definition of law thirdly article 368 amended protecting the constitutional amendment from the purview of article 13 fourthly in the case of constitutional amendments president of india cannot exercise what is popularly known as absolute veto or suspense veto or pocket veto 
in instead he has to give his assent immediately there is no time for him to think over he has to give immediately similarly remember 25th amendment act 1971 added article 31c giving immunity to article 39b and c of direct principles with regard to article 14 19 and 31 it was also made clear that no law containing any declaration for giving effect to the direct principles can be challenged in any court on the ground of inconsistency with any provisions of the constitution so remember this is article uh, sorry the 24th amendment act in the meanwhile 26th amendment act 1971 abolished privy purses privy what is privy purses pension to the prince princess that is like government servants the old maharajas were used to be given the pension so mrs indira gandhi stopped this that is called privy purses so 26th amendment act 1971 abolished privy purses now the 24th 25th and 26th amendments were challenged in kesavananda bharathi versus state of kerala 1973 in supreme court this case is also called fundamental rights case very important landmark judgment 13 judges 7-6 the majority 7 and 6 so the decision was given in uh, by, by the supreme court this is the maximum number of judges case so remember secondly in this case remember what is the supreme court ruling supreme court held number 1 parliament can amend any part of the constitution including fundamental rights however constitution has given only limited power to the parliament so by virtue of this limited power parliament cannot convert the limited power into unlimited power that means they propounded what is popularly known as donor doni theory the constitution has donated certain powers to the parliament by virtue of this do, uh, do, what is donated they can they cannot convert this into an unlimited power so parliament cannot amend the basic structure of the constitution and most importantly the second proviso of uh, and of uh, uh, 25th amendment act 1971 which gave judicial immunity to any law made to implement any directive principle was struck down by the supreme court because judicial review is a basic structure however the primacy given to article 39 b and c that, that is directive principle why we have taken up this because we are dealing with directive principle though primacy given to article 39 b and c was kept intact now emboldened by the decision 42nd amendment act 1976 brought out by mrs indira gandhi so if this amendment provided primacy to all directive principles in addition to article 39 b and c it was also added that the parliament has got absolute powers to add delete modify overhaul any part of the constitution in the meanwhile remember 44th amendment act 1978 after janata party came to power they deleted article 31 right to property i have already told you for the first time in constitutional history one fundamental right was deleted now the 42nd and 44th amendment acts were challenged in the minerva mill case in this case supreme court upheld the deletion of article 31 but nullified the extension of protection of directive principles except article 39 b and c in this minerva mill case the yes, supreme court introduced the popular doctrine of harmonious relations between directive principles and fundamental right supreme court said that there is no inherent conflict between directive principles and fundamental right because both are complementary in nature it is the duty of the court to interpret the provisions in in the constitution such a manner so as to harmonize the fundamental rights and directive principles and in addition remember now 
let us say what are the criticism in this what are the criticism directive principles have been largely criticized one criticism is that they are all pious wishes of a old man number 1 it is nothing but a, nothing but a new year resolution to be broken on 2nd january second criticism number 3 it is a post dated blank check drawn on an unknown banker to be payable at the convenience of the bank see how it has been criticized it is a post dated blank check drawn on an unknown banker to be payable at the convenience of the bank it is a fabian socialism without socialism it is a veritable dustbin of the sentiments it is a manifesto of aims and the aspirations remember so this is the criticism now for the examination point of view what directive principles have not been implemented even partially number 1 uniform civil code article 44 has not at all been touched now partially it has uh, done right to work only partial implementation up to 100 days number 3 not much has been done on the participation of workers in management similarly separation of judiciary from executive nothing i mean it, it has been touched not all states have covered this now in addition to directive principle there are some other directives in the constitution which you should know these directives are not judicial what are those number 1 article 350a regarding provision of adequate facility for instructions in mother tongue to the children belonging to linguistic minority groups so imparting education in the mother tongue secondly article 351 to promote spread of hindi language number 2 number 3 article 335 reservation should be in consonance with the maintenance of efficiency of administration so this is the directive principles which are seen as far as uniform civil code is concerned i will take a separate uh, class for about 10 or 15 minutes explaining what can be done by the what should be done by the government what is the background of uniform civil code to what extent we should implement it this is a, uh, thank you very much this is a very important chapter the next class we will take fundamental duties thank you very much thank you